Hey, we're so glad to have you worship the Lord Jesus Christ with us today and uh, hope you have, uh, are growing and becoming more like him as he calls us to. Uh, we know that God provides hope through his word and we pray that uh, this is blessing you in that regards. We also would really challenge you to become a part of a local church, that this isn't a replacement, this is a supplement to go, growing more like Christ. And so be connected with a body of believers that lift up the name of Jesus Christ and want to become more like him. Thanks for joining us. God's blessings upon you. Hope to see you at church some point in the near future. Blessings. If you're currently in school or were in school at one point, a question for you, what was your toughest class? What was the toughest class that you ever had? I had a number of tough classes over the course of my years, but I would have to say the absolute toughest was when I was learning biblical Hebrew. I felt like I was always on the verge of forgetting everything I had studied, even after doing it for two years. It was absolutely tough, but one of the things that I learned about these tough classes that I had is often they provided me with a lot more benefit than I realized at the moment. And I'm not just talking about content, although I did learn a lot of things and found Hebrew to be very interesting, even if it was extremely difficult. But I found that it also helped me personally, helped me to grow and open up my heart and my life in ways that I did not foresee. And in many ways, that is what I think we're dealing with today as we continue our study in the book of Daniel chapter 11. You can open your Bibles to it if you want. Uh, it might be actually easier today to follow along on the screens, but feel free to open them up to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, as I was working on it this past week, felt like one of the toughest college history classes I've ever had. I mean, it is a lot of hard work. And so it gave me an opportunity to say, why in the world would God put Daniel chapter 11 into the Scriptures? Of course, we all know the answer to that, and that comes from uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, which uh, says, if we can get it up there, all Scripture is God-breathed um, out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so, what Paul is saying, the Apostle Paul is saying, is the hard work of understanding the, the prophetic truths that were future from Daniel, but most of which have been fulfilled 2,000 to 2,400 years ago for us, trying to figure all that out in some way helps us be more like Christ, to grow in righteousness, to understand God's truth on this word, world, and in particular, help us face the challenges of living in the world in which we live, so that we are actually equipped for every good work. But sometimes to be equipped for good work, it takes a lot of work. And that was what was true of Daniel chapter 11 as I was going through it. And uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, this week how God reveals, I think through Daniel chapter 11, two key truths that we need to know about God. Next week, we're going to look at the same chapter, and we're going to see truths that relate to us directly as people. But today, we're going to be looking about two key truths that I think God wants us to understand from Daniel chapter 11. And the very first truth is this, God makes history with the future. God makes history with the future. God makes history. He actually doesn't just say this is what has happened, but He says this is what will happen, and it actually happens exactly as He said it will. He makes history into the future because He is a God who knows all things, can see in all times, and has the power to accomplish all things. And that is so evident in Daniel chapter 11, because as Daniel was given this vision of what was going to be coming ahead for the next 400 years in his life, what we have seen in an, probably one of the most miraculous ways of all the Scripture is how much control God had in bringing about what He said would happen. God makes history 
with the future. We have, we're working now on the fourth vision that God has given Daniel. And one of the things that I've noticed in these visions is that from Daniel's time to our time, most of the truth that God reveals about things that are future to Daniel is now in our past, but there is a small part, often typically at the end of the vision, where the truth that God reveals about the future is still future to us. And we see that in the exact same way. The first thing, though, we're going to be looking at is all the ways in which God predicted in Daniel's day about things that would happen over the next 400 years. And I was struggling, how is the best way I can work through this? And I thought the best thing I could possibly do, and we'll see if it works or not, is basically kind of read the passage, or most of the passage from Daniel chapter uh, 11, verses 2 through 45. I will be skipping around but then show you, as we go through, through a timeline, how God fulfilled what He was going to do and what He said would happen in Daniel and day and beyond. Starting with verse 2 uh, in Daniel chapter 11. Let's see if I got this working here. Uh, is it pulled up? There we go. All right. So, we're starting... Uh, around 550 B.C., the uh, time in which Daniel's vision is, um, there we go, Daniel's vision actually occurs is around 536 B.C. Daniel starts writing these words at that time, and now I will show you the truth. This is the Lord speaking to Daniel in this vision, and he's, gonna t he's saying, I'm going to show you the truth of what's going to happen. He did, we didn't know it at that point. For the next 400 years, you can take it to the bank. You can be as confident about the future as you are about what's happened in the past. Here is the truth. Daniel is living under the Medes and Persians. Cyrus, as we saw last week, is the king at the time. And God goes on and says, behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia. And so in a few short years, one, two, and number three, pop up. And then there is a fourth that comes a number of years later, 51 years since the Daniel's prediction, King Ahasuerus, or also known as Xerxes, who, by the way, happened to be the husband of Queen Esther, starts ruling in 485. He is the fourth prince who is coming. He shall be far richer than all of them, and when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up the kingdom of Greece. His wealth was impressive, and we can get a sense of his impressive wealth through the remains of his capital that he built. Here is the stairway entrance up into the capital areas. These are statues that would have greeted you. Huge. You can see people down below. They look like ants just ginormous, and then here is the entire complex, a huge, beautiful uh, area that he built with all his riches. And in his riches, then, he stirred up the, king of, uh, he, the kingdom of Greece. He attacked Greece numerous times. 130 years later, then, after Ahasuerus dies in 465, 130 years later, there is another king on the throne, which the Scriptures aren't concerned about. They're trying to get to a key point where a mighty king shall rise. This person is from Greece because he was mad that King Xerxes attacked his country, and that mighty king was none other whoops, than uh, oh, Alexander the Great. 205 years after Daniel saw this vision in 331. This mighty king arose, and he shall rule with a great dominion and do as he wills. So here was the Medo-Persian empire that becomes Greek overnight, practically, because of the power in which uh, King Alexander took over. And so, uh, it establishes now a new empire in control of the world, in particular in control of Israel, and that's the Greek empire. 
As soon as he has arisen, though, his kingdom shall be broken and divided towards the four winds. And he died only a few years after conquering basically all the known world. And his kingdom was divided in 323 among four generals. They weren't his posterity, nor according to the authority in which he ruled. They didn't rule over the entire area. Instead, his kingdom shall be plucked up and shall go to others besides them. And so his four generals, not people related to him, were divided up his kingdom. And so they took this kingdom here and they divided it into the four different colors that you see there. Amazing how much how accurate it is. In fact, one of the things that's so interesting is people who criticize the Bible say this is so accurate, it had to be written after these events happened. But there are so many indications even in this passage that show it was far earlier that God really did know the future. So then what we have is these divisions of the four, uh, the four areas of the kingdom of Greece. Then the king of the south shall become strong. The One of the generals shall become strong. And one of his princes, though, will become stronger. So, what we see, a king of the south starts taking over when it's divided up. He has a general, but his general now becomes stronger, and he shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. And so, we see uh, the second guy, this general coming up, he gets power. And basically, from this point on, it's like starting and with Abraham Lincoln and covering all the way to today. So about 150, 160 years that pass from this point on through the rest of Daniel. Uh, so starting with Abraham Lincoln all the way through. And so the king of the north is in that yellow area. It's the Seleucid Empire. The kingdom of the south there is in the purple area. That's Ptolemy. And we're going to kind of zoom in and see them fighting. And now their names are kind of strange. Seleucus and Antiochus were the kings that were in the northern kingdom, and Ptolemy in the, is the one in the southern kingdom. But I'm just going to say king number one from the south, king number one from the north, all right? I just try to make it as easy as possible for me, not you. Uh, anyways, I'm the one that has to do the talking on all of this. Uh, anyways, so we, heard we have the kingdom of the north. After some years, they shall make an alliance and the daughter of the king, the second king from the southern empire, the daughter of the king of the south, shall come to the king of the north. And guess what? They get, maybe, married. Right? They make an arrangement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure. But she shall be given up, and her attendants, and he who fathered, and all who supported her in those times." Basically, God is saying they're going to die, and they did die. You know why? Because in order to marry the king of the north, he had to divorce his current wife. And what happens with exes? You have all kinds of problems. In fact, if you could read Daniel chapter 11 as kind of like a political intrigue tell-all kind of book, that's what's going on here. She gets mad. She murders her ex-husband and murders his new wife all predicted some hundred years before that actually happened, according to the Scriptures. So, a branch from the murdered person from the south, his, her brother, gets upset. And he shall arise in his place, and he shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north, number three. So he attacks him and gets revenge. And he shall deal with them, and he shall prevail, and he shall carry off all to Egypt, all their gods and their metal images and the precious vessels of silver and gold. So he basically plunders them big time. Now at verse 10, a couple of the sons of the north, they get upset at that, right? So now they are waging war and assembling a multitude of great forces which keep coming and overflowing and pass through. And again, they shall carry the war as far as the kingdom of the south's fortress. Then the king, number four from the south, he's moved with rage. There's a lot of anger in the ancient world. Can you imagine that? Doesn't sound all that different from today, does it? He's moved with rage. He shall come out and he shall fight against the king of the north. And he shall raise a great multitude, 70,000 men, army, 
a huge by that day's standards. But they shall lose. They shall be given into his hands. And in those times there shall rise up against the king of the south and violent men of your own people. So during this kingdom of the south, while he's ruling, the Jews get upset because why? They're caught in the middle between the south and the north, right? They're getting caught in the middle. They end up rising up. They're violent. They try to rebel in order to fulfill this vision, but then they shall fail. They end up losing to Egypt. Then the king of the north sets his face to come with his strength of his whole kingdom, and he shall bring terms of an agreement of the, of the kingdom. And guess what they decide to do? They haven't learned from the past. He shall give to the king of the south his daughter, <laughs> except it's going the other way. Oh, there's the uh, battles. Here's another marriage. And guess what? It does not work out yet again. All right? He shall bring terms of an agreement to perform with them, he shall give to the king of the south the daughter of woman to destroy the kingdom. He thought his daughter would give him secrets about what's going down on in Egypt, and then he would be able to throw him over. But guess what? She ended up really falling in love with the king of the south, and she betrayed her dad. And so it did not stand or was not to his advantage. Verse 18. Afterward, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture many of them. But a Roman commander, or a commander who was a Roman, shall be put into an end his insolence. Indeed, uh, he shall turn his insolence back on him. He shall turn his face back towards the fortresses of his land. But he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. He gets back from having all these victories and one of, a mob from one, of his own, from one of his own cities attack him and kill him. I mean, it's just insane. Verse 20, then there shall be rise in his place another king, 180 send, who shall send an exactor of tribute. Because of Rome's involvement, now a lot of these Greeks and kings are having to pay tribute to Rome to kind of ensure their safety, all right? So he sends, he's got to send a lot of money to Rome, and so he sends someone out to collect taxes, What's interesting is this exactor, this tax collector essentially, goes to Jerusalem, tries to enter the temple to stake some of the gold from the treasury of the temple, and it is said that an apparition appeared to him, it nearly killed him, and so none of the funds were taken. One of the reasons why I think this was brought up uh, for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days, that king will be broken, neither in anger because of a mob, nor in battle, but instead, guess what? The tax collector killed his own king. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, you know, it would be selling all kinds of books uh, today if, if we had this kind of insight um, going on. In his place then, shall arise a contemptible or despicable person. This is Antiochus IV in 170, um, 175 B.C., 360 years. God says in His Word, this is a despicable man. Far, far in advance. You don't really want to be called despicable by God, right? That's not a good thing. And you'll see why He is so despicable. Here's actually a bust of him that we have recovered uh, in uh, antiquity. To whom royal majesty has not been given, he shall come without warning and obtain kingdoms by flattery. He was not in line of succession, but instead he kind of manipulated circumstances so that he could become king. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken. Even the prince of the covenant is broken. The prince of the covenant is most likely here the high priest. He murders the high priest who was going into the temple and leading in worship. Again, predicted by God centuries before. And from that time an alliance shall be made with him and he shall act deceitfully. He is known as the master of political intrigue of the ancient world. And he shall become strong with a small people, and he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south, who became king just a little bit before him. And so they start having this battles with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage a war, an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not be able to stand, for plots shall be devised against the king of the south. 
the king of the south was undermined by two of his own advisors, so that Antiochus IV wins. Verse 29, at the appointed time he shall return, Antiochus will, and attack again uh, the south, but it shall not be like it was the last time, for ships from Kittim, Kittim is the ancient word for Rome, and guess what? Roman ships show up and help the king of the south. They shall come against the king of the north, Antiochus the fourth, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and he shall turn back, and he will be enraged because he lost and was humiliated, and he will take action against the holy covenant. This is what prompts Antiochus is a fourth attempt to wipe out the Jewish people. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. There was a debate in the ancient world in Judaism about who should be, they were actually fighting over who should be high priest. They were not concerned about worshiping God, they were concerned about who is in control of God's people. Forces from Antiochus shall appear and profane the temple fortress, and they shall take away the regular burnt offerings, and they shall set up the abomination. This happened in 167, 300, almost 370 years after Daniel predicted it. The abomination they set up was, he set up an image of Zeus in the temple grounds and required everyone to worship him and killed pigs on the altar. It made it desolate. It made it unusable for years. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. This leads to the Maccabean revolt where they are actually successful in expelling Antiochus and then cleansing the temple. Yet the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame." One of the things that I was struck by and learned from this is this is the very first time the Jewish people were ever persecuted or martyred for their faith in God as opposed to their ethnicity or other circumstances. The first time by captivity and plunder so that they might be refined, purified, made white until the time of the end for it still awaits the appointed time. Up to this point... Everything, oh, I should have gone on here, and so, uh, oh, oh, not yet. We haven't killed him off yet. Everything up to this point has followed along exactly as God said it would. From verse 36 through 45, though, there starts to be gaps, or God says something, but it doesn't happen, and yet there are some pieces where there are some connections to Antiochus. Verse 36, the king shall do as he will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and he shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. So yes, he did set up the image of Zeus, but he ends up claiming to be God himself, the first one that I know of that ever claimed that. He claimed to be God manifest. We've heard that before. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers. So the Greeks worshipped other gods, or even the Greek women, who uh, beloved some. They promoted Apollo or Adinus. He promoted Zeus instead, so he introduced a new one. And then he shall pitch his palatial tents, in verse 45, between the sea and the glorious mountain, which did not happen, which gets us to scratch our head, what's going on here? But yet his end shall come, and none will be able to help him. He ends up dying in such a way that none was able to help him because he died of either disease, insanity, or depression somewhere in Persia. That is the history of 400 years as fast as I could do it, all right? And it's all been fulfilled. But there's still some future left for us. There's still some things that have not been fulfilled, and we get a number of hints in this passage and in the context of Daniel of what was going on. Laura, if you could pull up Matthew 24, uh, verse 15, we are clued in to that with the abomination that is desolation because Jesus says, not only did that happen way back in time before, but it's going to happen yet again. So Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation that's spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, 
understand that God's work and prophecies has not been fulfilled. Starting with verse 36, what we start to see is hints of things that still happened in the past at the time of Antiochus, but that Antiochus really becomes kind of a prefigure of the Antichrist. That, that really, as bad as Antiochus was, he wasn't as worse as it's going to be. We see that in like verses 35 and 36. Some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, made white until the time of the end. You see, God is saying already, the time of the end is not coming, but the persecution for people's faith will help refine and purify and make white those people. We are still in that season. God still is doing His work of refining and purifying us. For it still awaits the appointed time. It's still kind of saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to go further out here. In fact, when it says, and the king shall do what he wills, what's interesting about that, it's the only time in this entire chapter that the king of the north is not mentioned. We would think that that would be the case. It doesn't say, and the north. It just says, the king. And why is that? Because we have learned from Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 9 that the final empire is Roman, not Greece. It's Roman. And after 69 weeks, during which all of these events occurred, there will be a 70th that we are still waiting to have happen because we are waiting for the Antichrist to come. And so... Really, verses 36 to 45 are mostly about the Antichrist. Pull up verse 36. That king, the Antichrist, will do as he wills during that 70th week, those seven years of the Great Tribulation that's still in the future. He shall definitely exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and he shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. Go to verse 37. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his father. This is what clues us in that it's not just Antiochus, because he still did worship one of the deities of Greece. But the Antichrist says, there's no other god but me. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the, the one that's beloved by woman. Most likely here a reference to Jesus. He could care less about Christ, hence he's Antichrist. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. Verse 38. He shall honor the gods of fortresses instead of deities or even God himself. He is militaristic. He is worshiping physical, mighty power. A God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver. And so he's throwing money at his military with precious stones and costly gifts. Verse 39. He shall deal with the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign God. Well, I thought he didn't worship gods. Oh, he didn't. But we learn from the New Testament that any idol or any foreign deity is, is inspired by the demonic. And I think when this, it says, he shall deal with the strongest military opposition that's against him with the help of a foreign god, it's talking about the devil himself. He's satanically inspired and is empowered to win big time. Those who acknowledge him, he will load with honor. He's he shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. Verse 40, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. And also the king of the north shall rush upon him. So he's now, remember how this division between south and north earlier? They're now hating him and attack him. The north attacks like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And they shall come into the countries and shall overflow and pass through. Verse 41, it's talking about the final battle, leading up to the final battles, that war of starting with in Armageddon. He shall come into the glorious land. The Antichrist shall invade Israel. Tens of thousands shall fall and die, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the main parts of Ammonites. It's basically the, the country of Jordan today, which, interestingly enough, those three countries were non-existent at the time 
of Antiochus IV, which indicates this was written during Daniel's time, right? Kind of cool. Take a look at verse 44. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him. We learn from Revelation that a mighty military force somewhere from the east, thousands and thousands in the military, I wonder what country that could be, are coming and will invade Israel. It alarms him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy, destroy and devote many to destruction. In verse 45, he shall pitch his palatial tents between the seas and the gl- glorious holy mountains. So he's somewhere between the Dead Sea and the, the Mediterranean, close to Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end, and none will help him, because he is defeated when Christ returns. Friends, that's how God makes history with the future. That's the first point, and it took me about 25 minutes. Now the second point, which will be much shorter, but it blew me away as I thought about it. The second truth is that God endures great hostility until He ends it. God endures great hostility until He ends it. God said, this is all going to happen in the future, Daniel. All the political intrigue, all the opposition, every, all these different ways people are opposed to living for Christ. God says He's going to let it happen. When someone does something wrong in our hearts and our, in our lives, we get upset, right? God says it's going to happen many, 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 many times and yet I am willing to endure it until the very end. Why was the world destroyed because of a flood? Violence, right? What did we just finish looking at? All this battle back and forth, back and forth, north and south, right and left. The violence even affected God's own people. Remember verse 14? In those days many shall rise against the king of the south, including the violent of your own people, but they shall fail. When I was going back through this passage, I was struck. Every one of the Ten Commandments is listed as being violated and broken during this passage. Take a look. The first one, shall have no other gods. The king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Commandment number two, shall not make idols. He steals the idols of the northern king and brings them back to his own home. Number three, don't take the name of the Lord your way. The king shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. This is all in which God is allowing it to happen. Number four, Remember the Sabbath for worship. His forces will force people to stop offering regular burnt offerings. Commandment number five in terms of honoring your parents. We saw how one king gave the daughter of woman to destroy another kingdom, but it did not stand to his advantage. She ended up betraying her own dad. Families torn apart. By the way, does this sound very familiar to our day? Number six, murder. Army shall be utterly swept away before him. Even the prince of the covenant, the high priest, is murdered. Commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. After some years they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the daughter to the king of the north, and they shall make a covenant. Jesus says to get a divorce to marry another is committing adultery. Number eight, shall not steal. He took the, from the northern to Egypt, all their precious ve- vessels of silver and gold. Number nine, shall not bear false witness. Antiochus, seduced with flattery those who violate the covenant, deceive them. And the tenth commandment of not covenanting, even the king of Greece, though he was rich, or not Greece, but Persia, Artaxerxes, or Xerxes, The fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he's come strong through all his riches, he wants even more. And so he attacks the kingdom of Greece. 
God set it up so that time and time and time and time again, people resisted His will. God endures great hostility until He ends it. The most powerful verses, not even complete verses, in this whole chapter of all this sin going on is the end of verse 36 and the end of verse 45. The Antichrist shall prosper until indignation or God's wrath is accomplished for what has been decreed shall be done and he shall come to his end with none to help him. That last phrase, that last sentence basically says all that you have read, all the political intrigue, all the murders and adulteries and you name it, the horribleness of the human heart expressed for hundreds of years, now millennia, is endured by God until He ends it. What's our take home? How's this supposed to help us live for Christ in such a time? I think it's this. Trust God's goodness during these contentious times. Trust God's goodness during these contentious times. When you see evil happen in this world, does it shock you? Does it get you angry? At one level, it should, because it's evil. When we see on our TVs riots and wickedness and evil, whether it's on the left or the right, pull up those pictures. Do I not have those? You find it? The riot of the Portland or, or the, the storming of, there we go, Portland's there on the left, or the storming of the Capitol in January. When you see that, we're like, oh my word! I can't believe the evil of the human heart. We get upset, and yet God has been enduring that for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, it's been a part of His plan. You see, the danger is when we see those kinds of things that we become tempted to respond to them just the way the world does. Have you ever been playing a game and someone cheats? You feel like cheating back. Or maybe when someone yells something that is wrong, you know that it's coming from the pit of hell. It is so easy to want to respond in the exact same way. But the problem is our focus becomes not on God, but on this world. And so as a result, we are left to disobey the Ten Commandments. I think Daniel chapter 11 is trying to help us to understand God knows all the evil that's coming. But with people of faith, we have to trust His goodness But because by golly, we need it. He knows the future. We must trust that He is good. We must trust His wisdom. That He designed this world to accomplish His purposes just to show how great He is. And what is the greatest goodness that I found about God in Daniel chapter 11? His patience. For Jesus said, if you're angry with your brother, even over something like a mask... It's the same thing as murder. Or if you lust after a man or a woman, it's the same thing as adultery. You see, the hope of Daniel chapter 11 is we have a God who knows the wickedness of the human heart that's inspired by the demonic forces. And yet he is just waiting to end it. And praise be his name, he did not end it in 150 
B.C. He could have. You could probably make a case that he should have, but he didn't. Do we truly trust that God is good, who knows all things, is wise and patient, so that when we see these things on the screen, we see and think, you know what? God is still good all the time. And all the time, He is good. Trust God's goodness in these contentious times. I'm not saying don't call sin, sin. Clearly, the Scriptures have just done that for a lot of human history. But God's people remember who is wise, who is in control, and who will bring the end when He finally says enough. That's why we celebrate communion. If you didn't pick one up on your way in, maybe walked by it, feel free to go get one right now at this point. We have the cellophane, the clear cellophane that allows you to get the bread, and then sometimes it's hard to get to the, the actual juice. By the way, if you are a person that has put your faith and trust in Jesus, communion is for you. This is not this church's communion. This is not ours the only way in which it's to be done. This is just one of the ways, in a COVID-friendly way, that we pause and we remember when we read something like Daniel's chapter 11, but for the grace of God, there go I. God knew to the nth degree what was going to happen in Persia and Greece. He knows to the nth degree what's going to happen at the end time during the Great Tribulation. And He knew how we, how we would sin against Him. How we would break the commands. God knew, and God waited for Christ, who trusted that God's goodness was true during the contentious times of his own day, which resulted in his horribly painful and excruciating death. I'm going to give you a minute to think and to confess any sins because the fact that Christ has not shown up means He is still waiting for people to confess His name and say, forgive me. Take a moment to seek and ask and receive God's patient forgiveness. Father, 
I'm thinking of the words that you called Antiochus and the Antichrist despicable. You say that because they never repented. They never sought your forgiveness. But they persisted in opposing you and showing you hostility in every way they could. Oh, let that not be found of us. Thank you for your great patience, such that while we were still sinners, while we were opposed to everything that you were about, Christ came and died for us. Thank you for your patience and your grace. Help us to continue to cling cling to your goodness of patient forgiveness. For the sins we confessed, thank you that they are washed away, made white as snow, because of the blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So after they were eating, Jesus took the bread. After blessing it, He broke it, gave it to His disciples, and He said, if I can get it out, (laughs) take, eat, this is my body. In the same way, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, got a tough one. I always hate it when that happens. I might not be able to drink it with you. Took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said it, gave it to them, and saying to them, "Drink of it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins." Thank you for coming and worshiping our great and patient and forgiving Lord Jesus. We've got a special treat for you today. We have coffee after our service. If you would like, it'll be outside over in this corner where all the grass is. But we've made some coffee and we would encourage you to get some, drink it outside, and we encourage you to come back in. In about 10, 15 minutes, we're going to be starting our Equipping You classes. Talk about this or Romans or biblical languages, all kinds of different classes. But let me leave us all with, if not staying, make sure you pick up your kids. That would be appreciated (laughs) by someone, I'm sure. Maybe not the parents, but that's another story. Let me leave leave us all with these words in light of the truths of today. From Paul in Ephesians. Finally, be strong, not in politics, not in money, not in opinions. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be withstand all the evil that you see in the day of evil and having done all to stand firm. Remember, we serve a patient God. He's been patient with us. He's still patient with this world. But someday He will say enough. And when He does, may He find that our eyes are looking to Him because He is good all the time, even today. Go with the goodness of God, and we'll see you next week. God bless.